welcome to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. How are you? <coughs> Doing good. Still got the TV, though. <laughs> Apparently. Oh, it's a, that's it's, too bad. It's, it's not good. It feels like it's been a long time since we were sitting here, but this is our normal. I was going to say, it's only been a week. Yeah. I was going to say, you have a nice vacation? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was nice to get away. It was, um, beautiful. Like it was nice to see my old friend I hadn't seen in a really long time. I got to meet his family. Yeah. Um, uh, his daughter cracked me up, <laughs> like um, just like sharp wit. Yeah. Uh, bright. I don't know. She she made me laugh several times. Okay. Um, there was a line that she used that I'm not gonna say on the podcast because I'm keeping this one kind of <laughs> to, my, to we, myself. Yeah. But. Um, yeah, I will remember it forever, I think. I'm pretty sure. Like, <laughs> nice. just yeah. off the top of her head comment that she made, like, really, really funny. Um, and, uh, and then we went to Tennessee, and it was, we were in the mountains of Tennessee, and it was gorgeous out there. And Dude, ain't no place better than that. Like, so many colors, so many colors. Yeah. Um, did some hiking around in there, and like, it was, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Tennessee's a cool place, man. Yeah, yeah. Definitely somewhere I could, like, there's, I don't have any intentions to ever move. I'm pretty happy where I'm at. Mm-hmm. But if I was going to, like, Tennessee probably be it. Yeah. I'm I'm looking at Kentucky. Kentucky's good, too. And, like, Tennessee or Kentucky, like, either of those, like, I kind of look at them in the same light. Um, but, yeah, like I say, that's that's definitely a good place to be. No state income tax in Tennessee. Hey, there you go. I th- I'm pretty sure. it's. I think the Tennessee, Florida, Texas. Is that right? Those are your no no state income tax places. I'm yeah. pretty sure they they all take it out of you in property taxes. I'm pretty sure. Oh, I'm sure they do. Yeah. But like government gonna get her piece one way or another. Yeah. But uh. Well, but to be truthful with you though, like if I had to pick my tax between those two, mm-hmm. like I'd absolutely pick the property tax over the income tax. Yeah. Just the idea of taxing income really irritates me. Yeah, me <laughs> because too. Because it's the I most mean, it, complicated yeah. way to tax you. It's it's more. Uh, it makes more sense that um, property tax because it's essentially a wealth tax. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like okay, you you own this thing, and therefore. Yeah. The the more valuable the thing you own is, the more you pay in taxes. It, yeah. it just seems more fair. Yeah. Um, of course, all that gets kicked down, you know. Like, yeah. So yeah. even if you're a renter, you're still paying it. You're yeah. just, you know, through us through another person, I guess. Mm-hmm. So exactly. Um, had a a bit of a a, a horrific moment today. I was um, I was idly looking at the Chinese restaurant menu that was sitting on the table in the break room at my office while I was filling my water bottle. Yeah. Um, and I like, yeah, there was a moment of horror. And then I was like, Oh, that says Hunan beef. I, I misread it at first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was just like, and what did you read? My, it my eyes got wide. Well, it's just one letter difference. You know, uh, I, I read human beef. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hmm. And I was like, that's <laughs> strange. Yeah. You, you wouldn't be ordering any of that. No, no, no. I mean, maybe once just to try it. Well, yeah, say, exactly. Like, <laughs> you got to know, right? But no, I was a little surprised they had that on the menu. And then, then I, my eyes focused a little better because they got wider. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that was, that was interesting. Yeah. Um, but uh, that, that trip kind of prompted um, what I want to talk about tonight, okay. I think. Uh, yeah. we're going to, we're going to skip news for a week. Uh, yeah. I was going to say, because I don't have anything news wise. I mean, yeah. But, I mean, I, I, I've read plenty since I got back, but I, I don't know. It's just a lot of the same thing that we've been talking about, except that numbers are higher. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and as far as the mainstream, I mean, I guess there are, I mean, there's been a few other things, but like the, the deal with the, um, Israel is like all the news is right now. Yeah, even with the war in Ukraine, the front page of anti-war has been almost all. Yeah, uh, Israel, Israel, Palestine. So yeah, um, 
And nothing's really changed except it's getting worse. Yeah, Like, exactly. I mean, there's really, as far as what we would have to say about it, like, mm-hmm. it's just, uh, what, what yeah, we would you want is stop fighting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what we would want isn't happening, <laughs> so. No, it doesn't look like it's going to anytime soon, really. No. Um, I mean, we can talk about it. A l- I mean, there is there are some things that I want to say about that, but we'll save it till the end. Okay. Um, and it's not really going to be news. It's just, like, just more of a meta approach to... The whole no. thing. Yeah. But, uh, well, you know, while I was up, um, while I was up there with friends on my vacation, yeah. uh, there was like a, a relatively constant polit- political discussion, which I was a little surprised at actually. Like, uh, you know, I have other things to talk about. It's <laughs> funny, like, since I've been doing this podcast, really, I, like, my friends that I've known forever that we've talked about all kinds of other things for like what everybody wants to talk to me about is politics. Yeah. I have some of that myself. Yeah. And, and I'm into a wide variety of things Mm -hmm. and consider myself pretty knowledgeable on a wide variety of things, but particularly the people that know that I host a podcast about news and politics, like that's what they want to bend my ear about. Yeah. And I don't, I don't really mind it to be truthful with you, but like I, I do other things too, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I'm into other things too. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, and you know, even um, since I got back in touch with this guy or started talking to him more regularly again, that's what I should say. Never really lost touch, um, even though I hadn't seen him in 20 years. Yeah, we, you know, we um, emailed and. Um, and uh, talked on the phone every once in a while throughout that that period. So yeah. But uh, yeah, it was like it was like all, all not all, but a lot of politics this weekend. But oh, there yeah. was a, a thing that came up that I, I found kind of interesting. And I hadn't, I mean, I didn't get it entirely clarified, and I didn't really answer, I suppose. But there was the question of an elevator pitch for libertarianism. Now, I I don't know if it was an elevator pitch for becoming a libertarian or an elevator pitch for voting libertarian yeah, or exactly what we mean. So we, you know, what was meant. And I didn't really answer it in that way. Cause when it came down to like replying, it was still a discussion. So it was just, yeah. I mean, mostly I talked about like the, the <coughs> ways I think people misunderstand libertarianism and what, what libertarianism is at its core. Yeah. I wasn't really making a pitch, which was maybe my mistake. Like I had my opportunity, <laughs> right? And I didn't take yeah. it. Um, but I, I've been thinking about it some since then. So I guess uh, let's start with um, a an elevator pitch for being a libertarian. And then when we feel like we've exhausted that. Move on. Yeah, we'll yeah. do elevator pitch for voting libertarian. Okay. Yeah. So what would your elevator pitch, I'm I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here, but um, what would your elevator pitch for being a libertarian be? Well, kind of like we were talking about earlier, like I think, I think for me is it would be, you know, this country was built on libertarianism Mm -hmm. and I mean, it's not called that, but if you read through the constitution, that's a pretty libertarian document. Yeah. And, and well, the, and the Declaration of Independence even more so. Oh, is even so, more so. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, this country followed those principles for a very long time. Well, more or less. I mean, we. Yeah. You know, I mean, there was like slavery as, well, <laughs> as a really like, yeah. you know, sore thumb example of. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Uh, Absolutely. Of not being libertarian, but. Yeah. Um, and that's true. I guess I hadn't really considered that, but, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, like, so this country was, has done very well under the idea of the constitution and that type of thing. And I feel like at least the further we've pulled away from that, the worse things have gotten for us as a country. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think my big pitch for libertarianism is that, you know, we just need to get back to a more free society and, and with with freedom comes prosperity, mm-hmm. and that that's kind of like I mean I don't know that's kind of my pitch though. Um, I've got a Bob Dylan quote that I could like try and find, but um, but I'm not going to. So I'm just going to paraphrase. All right. Uh, 
it, where he says, uh, I don't think most people understand the level of responsibility that comes with their freedom. Yeah. Um, and that's something that I think as a culture, we've kind of, uh, shifted away from is any kind of personal responsibility, which makes it hard to be free. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've got one comes with the other, like with the freedom comes the personal responsibility and that, and that's hard for a lot of people. Um, like I, I, I just running through my head right now. Like I'm thinking of like people I know or that I work with, I should say, and, and things like that, yeah. that just like, that's, that's a hard thing for them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the response would be, um, the, that we are the most we are the most powerful and wealthiest country that's ever been. Yeah. So what we're doing is working great. Well, but it's built on the foundation. The, my my argument or a tort bet would be, yeah, w- what we are the most powerful country in the world, and I do feel like that that's built on the foundation from when we were established, mm-hmm. and that you know, and that we followed the principles of freedom. For, for a long time um, before we really started pulling away from some of that. Um, well, I think another response would be that we built all that on the backs of slaves. Wow. That, <laughs> I don't agree with that, well, per se. Okay, so I, I do have a retort for that. Um, the biggest accumulation of wealth in the history of the world yeah. was in the United States— or generation of wealth is what I should say. Yeah. Um, a- accumulation is like you went around and picked it up. Yeah. But wealth is created. Yeah. Um, well, and, and so the, the biggest creation of wealth, generation of wealth in the history of the world uh, was between the end of the Civil War and the beginning of the First World War yeah. in this country. Yeah. Um, relative, relatively peaceful period in the history of America. Yeah. Not completely. There's, you know, we've never really stopped warring, yeah, <laughs> but, right. but, um, but that was the biggest generation of, of wealth in the history of the world. Uh, in everything, except possibly just because of the size of the country and the number of people involved, except for possibly, uh, the liberalization of the, um, the Chinese, Chinese markets. markets. Yeah. Uh, in the last 30 years or so. Yeah. Um, because they had about, uh, about 10 times, maybe, oh, and actually now I'm thinking like 1870 United States compared to 1.3 billion people in China today. Um, yeah. I, I mean, there were probably 20 times the size of America at that time. Yeah. Oh yeah. F- 15 or 20. Yeah. Have to be. Yeah. Um, so yeah, any well, I don't know when I think about it. 1.3 billion. Yeah, oh no, no. Actually, like they might have been Yeah, they might have been a thousand times the size of the United States at that time. <laughs> really? That, that much yeah, you think? Yeah, because uh, um, you know, 1,000th of 1.3 billion is 1.3 million. Yeah. Um, we've got 330 million people now. Something like 600,000 people died in the Civil War. Yeah. You know, so right after the Civil War, I don't think that it's probably too far off. Yeah. I don't know. I, I I'm just guessing. Have to, have to look at. Yeah. Have to pull the numbers. Yeah. I'm I'm just guessing. At any so. rate, they're they're massive compared to where. Yeah. As far as the population is concerned. Um, but I mean, that was a huge industrial boon in the U.S. Um, I mean, people complain about the the robber barons. You know the. Um, yeah the uh Vanderbilts and you know the JP Morgans and um all those guys but the the truth is that they made the entire country wealthier yeah um they reduced the costs of um you know fuel or ener- energy costs in this country by to pennies what they had been on the dollar before uh same is true for like um construction materials steel primarily steel, I was going to say yeah um that made that made this whole country wealthier. Yeah. Everybody was wealthier during that time. Yeah, um, you know the, it's the rising all, tide. The, thing, I was yeah. fixing to say it's the all boats rise with the rising tide. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it it was the biggest uh, generation and accumulation of wealth in the history of the world until maybe most recently. Certainly per capita. Yeah. Um, it, like on a relative basis, it was the the biggest uh, during that period. 
um, between the end of the Civil War and the beginning of World War One. And even though, like, the U.S. Lot, lost a fair bit of its libertarianism um, with the decisions that were made around the Civil War, yeah, uh, it certainly concentrated power more at the federal level than it had been before. It was still a pretty weak federal government. Yeah. It was just more powerful than it had been before. Yeah. Um, and it was nothing compared to the federal government that has developed since Wilson yeah. and World War One. Absolutely. Um, I mean, that's. Yeah, I mean, there was no income tax in the intervening period. Yeah. Uh, the they instituted an income tax during the Civil War, and it was like one or two percent on the wealthiest of people. Yeah. And then it was dropped at the end of the war. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it didn't reappear until World War One. Yeah. Wilson reinstituted income tax in World War One. Even yeah. then, it was only one and two percent on the wealthiest of people. Yeah, um, it just but didn't go away. You know, but I, I was it telling only them, grew from yeah, there. Exactly, I was telling them this weekend um, that my you know not just income tax, my total tax burden. Yeah. Um, at this point, so state and federal income tax, uh, property taxes, uh, sales taxes, um, usage taxes, various other taxes that I end up having to pay. Um, is roughly half of my income. Yeah. Now. <laughs> that's insane. So. Um, that's not even counting the inflation tax. Yeah. So, so I would say that the 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 country's wealth wasn't built on slavery. Actually, the end of slavery created a boom. Created the boom that we're kind of living off of now. I yeah. would say. Yeah. Um, yeah, in a lot of ways, I, I think that that's true. I think this country is bleeding wealth now. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to, I, I actually, I actually looked at him when he said something like that to me about this being the wealthiest country in the world. And, um, and I was like, we're not the wealthiest country in the world. We're $36 trillion or $34 trillion in debt. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and like from that perspective, we're the poorest country poorest that, country. that's ever been. Exactly. No country has ever yeah. been thirty four trillion dollars in debt. Yeah. The difference um, the difference though yeah. is is we're still the most powerful country. Yeah. And that's that's kind of the distinction between, you know, us being I mean, sure, like as far as debt's concerned, we got it we've got it whooped, but we're we're still the most powerful country. And that that makes you feel like we're the richest country. Well, we probably control more resources than any country ever has. That's true. I can definitely. Um, see there's that. some wealth in in that. Yeah. Uh, but it's not like it's not like people's wealth. It's not like people are living well because of that. Yeah. I mean, although this is in a lot of ways, like I, I think that we're in the U.S. looking at the decadence that is that that is an empire in its death throes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, there's no, there's no respect for the, for wealth or where it comes from, how it's generated, how it's created, uh, which I may in some ways, um, be why there's such an, an interest in communism or socialism. Yeah. Yeah. And the idea that the businessman is just an evil person that's taking advantage of the people around him rather than providing opportunities to those people. Yeah. Like, uh, AOC said something, um, that was like, uh, you know, um, billionaires need workers, but workers don't need billionaires. <laughs> like, well, 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 who are they going to work for? I was fixing to say, yeah, like that's kind of how that works, right? Somebody will, and it, to There's really, somebody who to, has to accept the risk and invest the resources in advance. Say, exactly. That somebody has to take the risk and, and do the thing mm -hmm. and organize everything. Yeah. Put their resources up. Yeah. Risk, risk their resources on a project. Yeah. yeah. They need people to work for them. Yeah. But it's this is a mutualistic relationship. <laughs> Absolutely. This is not a parasitic relationship. It's a mutualistic relationship. So, Absolutely. Um, but. I mean, what do I know? She's got a she's got an economics degree from Boston University. So, oh uh, well, <laughs> well then. <laughs> I don't have an economics degree, so yeah, maybe she's smarter than me. <laughs> maybe <laughs> I don't know about all that, buddy. <laughs> I'm just but, trying to be fair. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, so, so we kind of drilled down into what I think my 
big pitch is? Like, mm-hmm. what would your big pitch for libertarianism be? Um, well, the first thing for me is that we are the largest pro peace party in the U.S. That's that's fair. Yeah, and I mean, when we're, we, we're small compared to the we're like we're third. We're third. Yeah, <laughs> first and second are way this, this, bigger. This than This is a us. real big drop off after number two. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, but we are the the largest pro peace party in the United States. Yeah, so. and w- and when we say pro peace, like we mean it. Like when we say we're anti war, we mean it. Yeah, bring them home. Yeah. All of them. <laughs> I'm, I'm not interested in all these conflicts all over the world. I don't yeah. want bases in 80 countries. And, I, and the other two parties, like, they may be good on, on one war issue and then bad on another. Like, that's not the Libertarian Party. Yeah. You know. Um, the other big thing that I would say... Uh, the other big thing that I would say is that um, that we want the most freedom for the most people. Yeah. And the and, and we want to strip away the power of the government. And of course, there's the whole thing about like your your big problem, like why there's so much po- political antagonism now that we talk about all the time, is because every four years, everybody's worried that the other guy's going to take control and oppress them for the next four years. Yep. Um, and if you took that power away, you wouldn't have that concern. And and the Libertarian Party, again, is serious about stripping away the power of central government, yeah. of decentralizing as much as possible. Yeah. Um, and for, you know, uh, uh, like some kind of evidence of that, I guess, um, not f- for what the Libertarian Party would do, but f- for just that the biggest problem in this country is government. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what I would say is I would just point to the that the the most corrupt industries in this country are also the most regulated industries in this country. Yeah. And you may make the argument that they're they're so regulated because they're so corrupt. But I think you have it backwards. I was going to say, if, yeah. I think history is on my side with this. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm talking obviously the military is the uh, government monopoly um, industry yeah. and it's completely and totally subsidized and incredibly corrupt. Yeah. Um, especially when you start looking at the private parties that benefit, uh, from, from war, from militarism. Yeah. Um, banking and finance. Yeah. Uh, I, I know a lot of people on the left are going to push back on that and say, well, no, the problem with banking and finance is because they're not regulated. Dude, Go start oh, looking at some regulated. regulations, buddy. I promise you they're <laughs> yeah. regulated. That, that is an extremely heavily regulated industry. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, you know, so, but the the people that are connected to government benefit and the government benefits. Yeah. That's, in fact, talking about that debt, um, the, uh, you know, the corrupt thing about that debt is that's part of the reason that we keep interest rates so low. Yeah. Is because the debt's a problem. Yeah, it is. <laughs> if, if you allow interest rates to rise, if you keep interest rates low, then it's not as much it's not as much trouble. And it's why um, they push inflation, why yeah. they want some level of inflation every year. Yeah, because I heard just yesterday, like the their the Fed is concerned or the Fed is is thinking that they're gonna be back to their um goal of two percent yeah like that's what they were saying just last night like Mm -hmm. but that's the like they're very open about that's the goal is to have at least two percent inflation and when i heard that like it immediately struck me because i was like so i really want to lose two percent of my income every year yeah like because that's what's happening and inflation benefits corporations and the government yeah um and it is uh um the opposite of benefiting yeah, it's horrible for us. Yeah, um, <laughs> there's a better word. You're, you're for looking that. for the right I'm word. Just, I don't yeah, have it. Yeah, can't find it right now. Um, uh, but but uh, yeah, it's it's terrible for a consumer. Yeah. Well, and just think if if you had an administration in there that was like, you know, our goal is going to be to reduce inflation. We're gonna we're gonna start putting the tools down to reduce inflation, and they reduced it by like four percent every year. Just think. You mean to a deflationary economy? Deflation, yeah. It moved us to a deflationary economy, which, by the way, 
at least as far as I know, none of us have ever lived in. No. Like, I mean, if if you think just, <clears throat> we just kind of accept the fact that our money gets less and less valuable every year. Like, and we just kind of live with that. But just imagine if we lived in, if if the tables were kind of turned and every year your money just became worth a little more and a little more. Yeah. How good that would be for like the people. Yes. Um, and it would be, it wouldn't be as good for business, but if it's consistent, they can plan for they it. They can plan for it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but it's certainly better for the vast majority of Americans that are buying stuff. Oh, absolutely. Um, and uh, savers as well. Of course, uh, uh, an inflationary economy is bad for savers. Yeah. Um, but savers are really important because that's how you fund the next generation, <laughs> generation. of everything. Yeah. Uh, of production. Exactly. Um, anyway. Okay. So you have, of course, the military banking finance, uh, medical or healthcare industry, no. heavily, heavily regulated, seriously corrupt. No. Um, the, this is another one where, um, it, it keeps being concentrated into fewer and fewer companies corporations that own everything in healthcare. Yeah. Um, the prices keep going up. The quality keeps going down. I went and saw a doctor the other day. I waited for an hour and saw the doctor for two minutes. Oh yeah. Did you get any good information through not that really. two minutes? <laughs> I bet you didn't. <laughs> um, essentially we decided that I'm not coming back. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we decided. Oh, that's <laughs> hilarious. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's not really, but it's sad really, but yeah. Uh, so, and that didn't used to be that way. Like, I really like my my family doctor, my uh, primary yeah. um, care physician. Yeah. Um, but even even with her, I don't get a lot of time. And I, re I remember a period. Like, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but it was actually like yeah. 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, that, that I didn't feel like I was being rushed in and rushed out every time I went to the doctor. But I do now. Oh, yeah. Um, and it's because it's been regulated to such a degree that it's hard to profit. Yeah. Yeah. You and, got, and you got to turn patients, turn patients. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that complain about profit, that profit is a terrible thing, but self-interest is just a fact of life. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's the main thing that motivates people to do things for people they don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good way to put it. I never thought of it that way, but that is a, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. And, and so it, like, if you take away profit, then it, people just look out for their own. Yeah, exactly. But, but profit is a way for people to look out for their own while helping people they don't know. Yeah. Um, anyway. Uh, and then the last thing is energy. Yeah. Uh, energy industries are, <coughs> are very corrupt as well. Uh, a lot of it is, um, it's all is subsidized. government controlled, yeah. uh, subsidized by government, et, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, Anywhere you start inserting government subsidies, you're going to have corruption. Yeah. Like, and, and even your more liberal people like admit that. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the retort I've always gotten from them is, yeah, but we just got to do more to rein that in. I was yeah. like, well, if we didn't do it in the first place, we might have to rein it in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, that's just me. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that I would say is that uh, that every power that you give a, a government is a freedom that you're giving away. Yeah. And uh, and at this point, I think that government is just an impediment to the flourishing of people. It is. Um, certainly government as it exists now. Yeah. Obviously, there's some level of government where it doesn't get in the way as much, or where people well, can still, like, you know, um, flourish in a in an extravagant way. Extravagant it's, is not the right word there. It, it goes too, back to something that we talk about a lot on this podcast: is is local government. Mm -hmm. Your local government is accountable to the people that live in the area. Yeah, like that's what. Well, you just have far more control over them. Well, exactly, and, and but yeah. that's a big deal. Yeah. Like that my, makes my one vote in 120 million doesn't really have a whole lot of impact. Yeah, and I would say it has none. Yeah, um, on at the federal level, but uh, my vote uh, um on my HOA with like only 10,000 people or whatever. That's yeah, that's a more that's significant. A, that's a vote. You know? like, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. So yeah, it's it's. It's not, I mean, I personally would like to take government away entirely, but you'll um, never, but that, that's kind of a fallacy though. You'll yeah. never, you'll never truly, well, there will be organizing bodies, yeah. but there's a difference between, 
Um, and, or an organizing body that imposes itself on the people and an organizing body that people voluntarily participate in. Yeah. Which uh, is the reason the local works. Mm -hmm. is, there, there's the, you know, I've brought it up before. There's, that's the difference between a leader and a ruler. Yeah, absolutely. Like people voluntarily follow a leader. Yeah. A ruler imposes himself on the people. Yeah. And has to put the hammer down periodically to keep them in line. Yeah. So yeah. there's that. <laughs> um, so those, I, I guess that's essentially my pitch for libertarianism is that, um, is that government is an impediment to human flourishing, um, that we are the, the, the most, or the only, or the largest pro peace party, um, and, uh, and every time you give the government a power, you lose a freedom. Yep. Absolutely. Is that, how's that? Is that that's, that's good. I like okay. it. I like it. Um, I've thought about it a bit since then. I didn't really like put it into words yeah. exactly yet. Um, so it's something right. I'm going to think about more because, because we do need to have like a solid, like go to pitch. Yeah. And I don't feel like I've really got that. Like you kind of sprung this on me tonight. So yeah. I haven't had a night to mull it over. But, um, well, okay. So another thing is that like some of the stuff that I talked about in my, uh, keynote at the, um, the Baldwin County, County affiliate yeah. convention, um, is just to, to try and bring it around to pointing out to people that the problems that they face every day, the root is in government Yeah, because it, it pretty much always is not, I mean, there are <laughs> yeah. things that are outside of government control, but, but a lot of the, it's certainly, um, market issues end up coming back around to the government. Like it's the vast majority of, of problems that are, are that people deal with day to day. The root is in some kind of government policy regulation or decision. Yep. And, uh, and a lot of people stop short of that. They want to, you know, they want to blame the, um, the capitalists for, uh, you know, signing these, um, uh, high risk loans uh, yeah. to people, but actually it was government policy that, that urged them to do so. And then it was government buying up these things that, that encouraged them even <laughs> further, yeah. um, that led to the 2008, uh, housing market collapse. Um, there, you know, it's, it's things like that. People, people often want to blame the market for a problem that was created by some kind of government regulation or policy. Absolutely. Um, and the market's the best thing that's ever been. Um, yeah. it's, it's more responsive than, it's more responsive than government. It gets the most <laughs> things to the most people. Yeah. Most efficiently. You yeah. Know, way I mean, more efficiently than a bureaucrat or a government could ever do. Yeah. Well, and uh, the scarcity is a rule. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, of course, it's it's always Thomas Sowell, right? Yeah. Uh, Thomas Sowell said the first rule of economics is scarcity. There's never a, enough of a resource to satisfy all the demand for it. Yeah. Um, the first rule of politics is to ignore the first rule of economics. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but but there's a you know yeah scarcity is a is a reality, but it's it's when government steps in and. Um, price fixes that you end up with shortages. Yeah. Scarcity exists. Shortages only exist when somebody's fooling with the market. Yep. Um, otherwise, resources tend to distribute themselves in the most equitable way. Yeah. Uh, in other words, to where they're most needed. I don't mean like everybody gets the same amount. I mean yeah. to to where the real importance of that resource is because um, businesses, people have to make decisions about what's more important to them. Yeah. And, and in a market, the price reflects exactly that. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, it reflects the demand, the, the supply and demand, and then the decisions that people make are based on that, and they prioritize what's what they need more than other things. Yeah. Um, and so then the resources are distributed to the places where they're most needed because the places where they're most needed are places where people are most willing to pay a higher price. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Doesn't doesn't seem that hard. I mean, you know, when we talk about um, minimum wage, uh, as an example, like you know, I often make the argument like it's better for it's better for somebody to work for two dollars an hour than zero. Yeah. Than not work at all. Not work at all. Yeah. And 
the truth is just taking away minimum wage in the end would drive prices up Yeah, because um, there would be more jobs because you're obviously you're not hiring anybody that's going to produce less than what you have to pay them. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, if you set a zero minimum wage, people can work for anything that they're willing to work for. Um, that creates actually a lot of more jobs out of nowhere. It yep. becomes profitable to hire more people. And, um, and then when, when businesses are competing for employees, instead of employees competing for jobs, yeah, then that drives prices up by itself. I mean, so you increase the demand for workers. Yeah. What does that do? Look at your supply demand curve. You increase the demand for workers without changing the supply. It drives the price up. Exactly. And it opens doors for people. That's the mm-hmm. thing that really gets me is that it, it gives people it gives people a door to go through, you know, because yeah. you can make the best out of anything and you can make something work. Yeah, that guy that know? takes that two dollar an hour job, now he's um uh creating skills, establishing experience that he can go take and find a job that pays him more than two dollars an hour. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Or so. he does really well in that job and they offer him more than two dollars an hour so that he'll stay there. Exactly. Or she. Yeah. I'm not trying to be sexist about this. <laughs> right. Yeah. But it's true. Like it's it, it opens doors. So Yeah. Um all right. Well, how about a pitch for a voting libertarian? Um that's a kind of a different question. It is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I, to me, I guess, is if you want to see real change, like political change, you need to vote different. And libertarians, where it's at, like I mean, we are the third biggest party. Like, if if you're going to pick a party, we are the third biggest. And you're the the truth is, is we're never going to see real change through the main two parties. Mm-hmm. And we know that. Like everybody kind of knows that. And so yeah, like that's that's what need that's that's where that's the reason to vote libertarian. Yeah. Well, that's essentially my pitch too. Um, is that the the Republican and Democrat parties have controlled politics in this country for 160 years. How has it been that long? Uh, I was actually trying to, trying to think of when that, when, uh, when they came into being, I guess that's about yeah, right. 1960s. Wow. Okay. The Republican party is the newest one. Democrats wow. have been around even longer. That's wild. Um, okay. And they flipped over time and they're still flipping uh, now. No, uh, I mean, well, definitions the, have changed a little bit, but they haven't really flipped over time. Um, well, they, they, perceptions have flipped in a lot of ways. Well, like the idea I mean, that the Republican Party is the racist party now, or the oh, Democrats yeah. used to be, and so forth. Yeah. Well, I, I would say that the the Democrats are still bigoted. They've just changed the focus we're, of their bigotry. Yeah, I'd agree with that one hundred percent. But they do shift, like I say, because yeah, like there was a time. Not long ago, you know, 20-something years ago where the Republicans were the gung-ho war party. Yeah. And then they, they under Trump, they've kind of shifted away from that. They're kind of heading back now, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, Ron Paul started that change, and then, um, then of course, Trump's Trump popularity and being it, out yeah. there saying that war was bad made it okay for Republicans to be anti-war. Yeah. Um, in a, in the mainstream in a way that it hadn't been before. Yeah. Uh, best thing he did, yeah. by the way. Um, and the, the Democrats were, yeah, were mostly anti-war until Obama. Yeah. And then nobody wanted to speak out against Obama. I, I yeah. think, I don't know what the real reason was, but that Obama starting a bunch though. of wars. Yeah. Um, nobody was going to criticize that or very few. Yeah. And so it just like, completely silenced the anti-war wing of the, of the Democrats. Yeah. Um, who had been very vocal during a uh, Bush, the young, oh, I remember during Bush, they were, well, because it's funny because under Bush, that's kind of where I was at. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. if, like I say, gun to the head, if I had to choose between the Republican and Democrat, mm-hmm. um, through through the mid two thousands, I was choosing a Democrat. Yeah, and war was the reason yeah. because they at least they were against what we were doing in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. But that changed. Yeah. So. Yeah, it definitely changed um, by the end of the Obama administration. Yeah, uh, that was different. I mean, I would I would say that the truth is that that the majority in both parties have been pro war and always have been. 
Yeah. Like the rhetoric has changed. I don't know that yeah. the actions really have. That's, there's, that's probably some truth to that. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that the you know these two parties have been in control of this country for 160 years, and we haven't been improving over that time. No, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so the same thing that you said. Like if you want thing, if if you think that things are moving in the right direction, then you know keep, keep voting for Republicans or Democrats. Yeah. Um, but if you don't feel like things are or moving in the right direction. It's not because of the other guy. Like yeah. if you're a Democrat and you don't think m- things are moving in the right direction, it's not because of Trump. Yeah. And if you're a Republican and you don't think that things are moving in the right direction, it's not because of Biden or yeah. Obama. Yeah. Um, it, it it's, it's both sides. Both sides are contributing to this thing in, in a terrible way. Yeah. Um, so if you want something to change, if you want to find a new direction for this country, if you think that, that things need to be different, you can't keep doing the same thing. Yeah. And so pick something different. And the truth is that when it comes down to it, I don't care if you vote for the Libertarian Party or the Green Party or the Constitutional Party or whatever. I don't I don't care. Yeah. Um but if you want things to be different, you can't keep voting for the Republicans and the Democrats. And yeah. I think we're the best option. Yeah. I think so. That's the reason we're number three. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And we know something about marketing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not a lot, obviously, Not, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but something. Well, and <laughs> something I was thinking about as we've been kind of having this conversation is libertarians understand economics. Like mm. you can talk to any libertarian, and they might as well have a minor in economics because, yeah. like, libertarians understand this sh- this stuff in a way that. Other people just don't. I almost had to put the explicit label on this. I know. It, right? it like almost <laughs> happened. Like pull I caught out, myself. <laughs> pull out the little sensor thing. Yep. Um, that I don't know. I actually recorded it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you had talked about it. Did yeah. you never do it? I'm probably not. We haven't had to use it. so Yeah. We've been really good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I. Th- there's definitely some truth to that. A lot of people disagree, though. I mean, there's a lot of people yeah. out there that think that, uh, that Paul Krugman... With it's his Nobel best Prize, economic. it's like, yeah. It's, yeah, no, that's true. But he's not. <laughs> no, he's he's um, kind of foolish. In the, in the I, libertarian. He's better than a lot of Keynesian-style economists, though. At least, he's, yeah. at least he's more consistent than most about actually like sticking to the Keynesian... Actual, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Economics in terms of like, you know, um, contracting uh, government spending when there's a boom and... Yeah. Um and increasing government spending during the the downturns. Yeah. Uh I I just I don't the think pro- that it works. I I I don't know. I should have well, I didn't know that he was going to come up exactly and I don't actually recall if he's a advocate of modern monetary theory or not. I, I got to um, believe he is, but I don't yeah. know. Um Yeah, I would assume so too, but I don't I don't know either. Yeah. So we won't we won't we won't we won't hang that on him, yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. I, I could I don't want to disparage him with that label if, yeah. since I don't know. Um, but yeah, uh, libertarians understand free markets. Yeah. Um, and then better than most. Them. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and understand that every all these little perturbations that occur from government um, sticking its fingers in um, create unforeseeable problems yeah. uh, in the future. Um, and the just, I don't know, manipulation of the market never, never benefits the whole. It only benefits small interest groups. The people that are manipulating it mainly. Yeah. (laughs) Or the people that are paying them. Yeah. Paying them to manipulate it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, So, (laughs) um, so yeah, I, I would agree. I think the, the pitch for libertarianism to vote libertarian, um, is that don't be driven by fear of the other guy. Yeah. To not vote for change. Absolutely. Like, Obama got up there, vote for hope and change. Yeah. And then nothing changed. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. He he paid off the banks. He started a bunch more wars. I mean, like, what more do you want? Uh, Bush got up there, too, and said, we're not going to use the military to nation build. And then turned around and did it. Yeah. <laughs> like, tried like to do it in at least two countries. Blatantly. Yeah. yeah. Three countries, really, because Somalia's in there too. Just nobody talks about it. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I like, there was a, the question of 
like have to choose between Biden and Trump. And I was like, I don't want to choose between these. I, I think they're both terrible. Yeah. Like these are both terrible. <laughs> these are both terrible options. Come on, man. I don't support either one of these guys. Gun to your head. <laughs> Pull the trigger. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, but when it comes down to it, like if I absolutely had to choose between Trump and Biden, I would choose Trump because the most important thing to me, he was better on. Yeah. Which yeah. is the foreign policy stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's a really low bar yeah, to say is. Trump didn't start any new wars, but he might be the first person not to start a war during his presidency since Woodrow Wilson. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, since before Woodrow Wilson, because obviously Woodrow Wilson started a war during his yeah. Pre- yeah. Uh, presidency. But I mean, I can't, I can't think of a period since the beginning of World War One where within a four year period, we didn't start some military conflict somewhere. Yeah. Well, four or eight. Yeah. Because some of them it, had two Yeah, terms. in four yeah. years. Yeah. 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 Um, four or eight, right? Yeah. I mean, I might be wrong about that. I don't... If, if have to so go back it's and been look, a long we, time. Yeah. And the truth is that we've been a pretty militaristic country from the very beginning, so... Yeah. There may never have been a president that didn't start <laughs> some new military conflict. Now, um... Against Trump, I would say that he did expand all the existing military conflicts. Yeah. When he entered office, everything that was going on, he added to. Yeah. And he's the one that started selling weapons to Ukraine. So you can <clears throat> really kind of throw the Ukraine the, thing at his feet. Right. Yeah. Um, because I don't think that Russia would have attacked Ukraine if we hadn't been pouring weapons into it while also talking about bringing them into a military alliance that's set up against Russia. Yeah. Hey, in Trump's defense, I've heard Trump mention at least once about bringing Russia into that alliance, too. Okay. So, I mean, there's that. That's fine. I mean, he couldn't do it, though. He no, was, obviously He was being not. accused of, uh, of being in league with the Russians, a traitor to the U.S. being in league to the Russians. Yeah. Um, and that man can't, can't have anybody say anything about him. He can't stand can't it. Can't stand have anything bad said about him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, his ego is well. A I mean, it certainly went the other way. He applied a bunch of sanctions to Russia. He sold weapons to Ukraine. Like it had the desired result, I think, by the people that were making those accusations. Oh, absolutely. Which was to prevent um, the U.S. from getting closer to Russia. And and look at what we've done as a result. We we've driven Russia to China. Yeah. Where you know, culturally speaking, for the most part, now actually, they Russia is so big that Eastern Russia is has a, like a strong Asian influence in their culture. And they actually yeah. look, um, More the Asian? people in, e- yeah, in East Russia look very Asian too. That's interesting. Um, but like the majority of the political power in Russia is um, white and more Western. Yeah. Like there's a, a natural alliance <laughs> there talking about these big three between the U.S., Russia, and China, yeah, like it would make more sense for Russia to be aligned with us against China than for Russia and China to be aligned against the U.S. Yeah. Um, but we've but pushed we them, rejected we've pushed Russia so completely that yeah, yeah. we've we've pushed them there, um, which is a um, very which, short-sighted, which is, which is just stupid. <laughs> I mean, it just it doesn't make logical sense yeah. like for us to have done that. <clears throat> All right, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about Israel Palestine real quick before we go. And I, I'm sure. not I'm not even going to introduce any more news. Um, okay. Although there, I mean, there is. There some, is, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm not going to introduce any more news. I just want to uh, to say to people out there, like, approach this with a little bit of nuance. Yeah. If somebody is not all in for Israel. That doesn't make them pro-terrorist. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And if somebody's not all in for for Palestine or a two-state solution or, or freedom in Palestine or Palestinian civil rights, um, that doesn't make them an autocrat or a slaveholder or, you know, yeah. I mean... Man, the Just, civil the civil rights one in particular really irritates me because I'm for civil rights for everybody. Yeah. Like everybody. Like I don't care. Well, it's not even just like average civil rights that the Palestinians don't have. Like they don't have basic human rights. Yeah. 
Absolutely. <laughs> like so, <laughs> let's start there, <laughs> <Yeah>, right? <laughs> um, and uh, so, I, I guess my point is this: just because somebody's not completely on your side doesn't mean that they're an enemy of yours, yeah. and they're not a terrible person. Like there are good faith arguments on both sides of this. There's good like people there, on both sides. There's good people on both sides of this. I heard that misquoted Very on good the news people on both this sides. week, and it irritated me to no end. I was like, man, like every, they do it all the time. Yeah. Just misrepresent it, man. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not talking about the Nazis. I, <laughs> you know, I'm definitely yeah. like, those are bad people. But yeah. uh, now I feel like I just play a bit of this Trump speech instead here, instead of me talking. <laughs> um, but... No, I, the the truth of it is that there's, like, there's no real good guys here. No. Um, everybody has understandable reasons for their actions, but atrocities are atrocities. Yeah. And and at, like I said before, one does not justify another. And this, I think, actually, Israel's making a a big mistake here. Like, I understand why they're angry, and they want retribution oh absolutely um but two things i no i'm not talking about news specifically i'm All talking right. about yeah um two things one the more palestinians die the more world opinion turns against israel exactly um and they have to recognize this yeah and they're going to to sink themselves and the U S because yeah. the U S is we will not so separate completely, ourselves. Yeah. Supporting yeah. what Israel's doing. I don't know how much pressure we're putting on in the background uh, to limit civilian casualties or, or whatever, if, but if we are, it's not working. I'll yeah, say that. yeah, that's true. Um, but we are inextricably linked politically with the Israeli government. Oh, that's another thing I want to talk about in terms of nuance. Palestinian and Hamas are not synonyms. Yeah. And Israeli and Jewish are not synonyms. Okay. Okay. If I'm criticizing the Israeli government, I am not <laughs> cons- uh, I'm not criticizing Jewishness or all <laughs> Jews yeah. or anything like that. In fact, there's plenty of Jews that are criticizing the Israeli government both inside and outside Israel too. Yeah, there are. Um, and there's been plenty of Palestinians that criticize Hamas both inside and outside of Palestine. Yeah. So there are internal disputes. Yeah. These these groups are not representative. They're not one and the same. They're not representative of one another. The political structure and the people are not the same. And we should want to keep it that way because I don't want myself as an American being identified with the U.S. government. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but anyway, yeah, so Israel's, I, I think, making a mistake because the more people die in Palestine, um, the more world opinion turns against them and the more world opinion turns against us. I guess I'm going to throw in a little bit of news here because, um, there's been 20 some attacks last I heard it was 23. I assume it's gone up since then. Yeah. Um, 20 some attacks, uh, rocket and drone attacks against U S bases and facilities in the middle East since this started. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and the reason well, they're it, attacking U.S. bases is because the U.S. is seen to um, endorse and support the Israelis' government's attacks against Palestinian civilians. And and from what I the reporting I heard on it, it really felt like this was kind of just like a precursor of things to come. Like these attacks have been like small and and whatnot, but could become very much bigger and more of a problem yeah, I don't as think there's this escalates. Any, I don't think there's been any um, uh, any deaths any as a casualties, result yet. Yeah, yeah. I think there's been some casualties if you're using casualties to also apply to injuries that take you out of service. Oh, okay. Um, maybe. That may be true. But, uh, but not many still. Yeah. Uh, my concern, again, is like I'm not actually that concerned despite all the rhetoric of... Um, well, I'm a little concerned. I, I shouldn't say that I'm not concerned because I am a little concerned yeah. that um, people in the U.S. government might use this as an excuse to start a war with Iran. I'm, but I oh, am. There's people trying. Oh, I know. 
But I, I think the Pentagon at least has enough sense to push back on that. Yeah. Um, the, the actual military guys, I think, know what a slog fighting Iran would be. Yeah. Um, and, and how much destruction Iran could bring. Yeah. Even though we would win in the end. Yeah. Um, but they have uh, a lot of accurate destructive missiles that could reach all over the Middle East. Yeah. Um, that would be a real problem. Yeah. And uh, attack our allies and and our bases around there. Yeah. I, I am, however, more concerned about um, using this as an excuse to to fight a war in Syria. We've already got troops there. Yeah. Uh, that you know, <laughs> I guess a lot of people don't know that we the United States military is still occupying like a third of Syria. Really? Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um. The yeah the U.S. military is occupying like a third of Syria still. Really? Um. This was the thing that they lied to Trump about. He said he wanted all the troops out of Syria. And I they remember said, okay, that. Okay, we yeah. got all our troops out of Syria, but they left about a thousand troops in Syria without telling him. Yeah. Yeah. Which, regardless of what you think of Trump, that should be a real problem for you. <laughs> it should be a problem for everybody. Um, that the that the yeah. person in charge of the military, the civilian leadership of the military, to keep us from being a military dictatorship. Yeah, exactly. Um, is being ignored by the military. Yeah, that they're hiding information from him and uh, um, directly contradicting his orders. Yeah, that's just it. I, Everybody involved in that should be put in prison. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, if, if we lived in a just society, like, that would happen. Yeah. You know, the thing that bothers me most of that about that is that there's an, there's plenty of people out there that hate Trump so much that will say, good, good. They shouldn't listen to him. They shouldn't. He shouldn't have had any power over anybody. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Do you not see the problem of the military being unchained from the civilian elected government? Yeah, <laughs> you don't, you right. don't see the issue there. <laughs> anyway, um, the uh, the other problem that I had in my head a moment ago, and now I can't think of. Oh crap! Uh, uh, dang. <laughs> no, I don't know, man. I yeah. can't help you. Should have written that one down. I guess right. so. Let me <laughs> fill in some space while I, I think <laughs> about this. Um, I'll do the best I can. So, I'm not not really good at time filling. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, yeah, the problem is uh, the rest of the world turning against Israel. Um, well, the other problem is that I... Well, it, the part of the problem is Israel is surrounded, like, and, and this is always the, the point that the neocons always make is, you know, Israel's surrounded by its enemies. Mm -hmm. Like, that's true. And that can actually be a very big problem for Israel if they overplay their hand here, which I do think that they're in the process of overplaying their hand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here's the other problem is that it's futile. Yeah. Um, because of the situation that the Palestinians, particularly in Gaza, are living, the conditions that they're living under, if Israel were successful in just completely eliminating Hamas— which is their stated goal at this right. point. Like, I've heard that this week. Yeah. I don't think that they can do it, actually, but it, but let's, let's say Let's just that say they, yeah, they did. For the sake of argument, they completely eliminate Hamas. Some other organization is going to step right in and be the same kind of thing yeah. because of the conditions that the Palestinians, particularly in Gaza, are living under. Well, and when I heard um, Netanyahu talking about that... Um, this weekend or the other day, I guess it's been, it's been more recent than that. But anyway, um, I, that's all I could think is that, you know, even for one, you just can't do it because the more, the more Hamas you destroy, the more it's going to grow. Like, I just, I don't see a way where you can completely root out an organization that is, whether you like it or not, I mean, they're advocating for the people living in mm -hmm. Gaza. Yeah. Um, and like I say, I'm not, I'm not condoning what they're doing, but that what they are doing is advocating for those people. Yeah. And there will be somebody advocating for those people through violence regardless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you've given them no other option. Exactly. Um, backed into a corner, cat in a corner. Yeah. Or whatever. I don't yeah. know. There's some particular. I just, but the, just the whole thought of, well, we'll just, that, that, and they they mean it, that they're just going to go in there and destroy 
Hamas and, mm-hmm. and root it out. Like you just, you can't, the, the way, the way you fix this problem is to fix what's going on in Gaza. Yeah. Like, and I don't understand why more people don't understand that mm-hmm. and see that. Like if, if you want to fix this pro truly fix this problem, like you've got to look at what the reality is for the people that are living in Gaza and come up with a solution. And I'm not saying that's going to be easy because it won't be. Yeah. But you, you, well, that, I, unfortunately there, this has progressed to a point that I, I think that the answer could have been a two state solution. Yeah. And uh, especially after listening to John Mearsheimer talk about this a bunch recently, yeah, that ship may have sailed. Yeah, I, I don't know that that's really feasible now. Yeah, yeah, um, because nobody trusts anybody. Yeah, yeah, like they already made agreements about this in the Oslo Accords, and the, like and nobody followed nothing. through. Like Israel didn't follow through. Yeah, and now you have these attacks, these like really brutal terrorist yeah. attacks. Yeah, um, killing fifteen hundred Israelis. Yeah, I just. Uh, it's it's hard to imagine that you can come back from that and then create a peaceable, divided. Well, I'll I'll tell nation. you this this much <laughs> for certain is it will take new and fresh leadership on both sides. Yeah. Um, well, and I, and I don't know that that's even, I don't even know that that's obtainable, but like that would be what you would need at a minimum. Mm. And and one other thing, because I I'm sure that there are people out there saying that. Uh, Hamas doesn't care about the Palestinians and they're clearly not concerned about individual Palestinian lives. Yeah. No, but I, they are concerned with the Palestinian cause. Yeah. Well, and they're that's, just, they're willing that, to sacrifice citizens for the Palestinian cause. And that, that's what it boils down to. Exactly. Yeah. Like you said, they're, they're, they, they care about the cause, but not, maybe not so much the people. Mm-hmm. Um, they're willing to sacrifice their people for the cause. Yeah. Um, and I, like I say, I and don't, the next I group don't will condone too. it. Well, it, they absolutely will yeah. because they have no other option. Mm-hmm. They're backed in, just like you said, they're backed into this corner and there's only so many ways out. And this is the only way they see out is to fight their way out. Yeah. I well, uh, let's go ahead and wrap up. Um, and the, and, and I'll just finish up that stuff with saying, you know, uh, something that I try and emphasize a lot on this podcast, which is like the guy who disagrees with you is not your enemy. Don't yeah. treat him like one. Absolutely. Or um, the, just, just remember that there's, there's reasons that people feel strongly about this. Um, maybe right, maybe wrong. Doesn't really matter. Yeah. That's the, they're not your enemy. Have, a good discussion or don't talk about it at all. Yeah. There's always that, (laughs) but there's no reason to cut people out of your life or whatever, or just get in a fight verbal or otherwise with somebody over this. It's, um, it's, it's important, but is it really that important to you? Yeah, no, I agree. Um, and you got to figure out whether your friendships or your other relationships are more important or not, I guess, <laughs> yeah. than this. Um, yeah. To me, the relationships are always more important. Absolutely. Um, so anyway, for uh, going into it without talking about any news and not having like a real strong outline. Yeah. Well, we never have a real strong outline. No, but you normally have some notes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> um we're over an hour. <laughs> so yeah. uh, let's, let's, let's wrap it up. All right. Let's wrap it up. Uh, so next week is what? The ninth. Um, yeah, I guess so. Uh, yeah, man. Racing through November. Now we had a nice, cool week. <laughs> it there wasn't nice. a day that it got up to 70 degrees this week. I don't think. I don't know. It was pretty warm one day, but maybe it, it wasn't, it wasn't like, astronomically more when I, that, yeah we're wasting so. more time but when i woke up this morning it was 63 degrees in my house oh yeah yeah nice. i was like ah, oh, all right yeah. it's a little too cold i had to pull out the quilt last night <laughs> oh yeah yeah my, and that my cats love one of them has lived under the quilt since it went on my bed she's oh yeah she's i guess she's just gonna spend all winter under that quilt <laughs> yeah we're not even quite to winter yet um i might have to turn on my heater soon though <sighs> Oh, well. Anyway, so we expect to be back next week at at any rate. I can't think of any plans that would interfere. 
Um, so uh, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean. Uh, like and share, comment, um, critique, what, review. That's the word, ah, right? Review, yeah. yeah. Um, you can always email me at michael at the liberty uh, you know, share whatever you like. And then of course, like tell your friends and all this other interaction, it just helps us, um, helps us a lot and we really appreciate it. So we'll be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life's short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.